what I was doing literally one hour ago was working on a manuscript that we are preparing to publish. This is something I've alluded to over the past year or so. It's finally come to fruition and we're going to submit it for publication. The joys of being a publishing scientist is the frustration of trying to then get your work published. But I do it for the students because these are all student led projects and I want them to have that experience and then have that help them get onto their next part of their lives and career. So what we found was so, so briefly uric acid um, and, and my friend and even collaborator on this project, Dr. Rick Johnson has really been the champion. I was unaware, I'll confess of the effects of, of fruit of uric acid, let alone the involvement of fructose until I read his work and became familiar with him. And it's been one of the great joys of my life professionally to get to know him better and now consider him a friend. He's a wonderful gentleman, a great scientist, guy. great guy. He was really the one who highlighted that every time your cell is metabolizing a molecule of fructose, it's giving birth to a molecule of uric acid, which makes it far more relevant to uric acid production than any amount of meat or fish consumption, which is yes. an idea that just continues to really fail. You see in the highest meat consuming populations on the planet, like Hong Kong and Argentina, their, their uric acid levels are, are nothing. They're absolutely bottomed out. And so let's, we just have to kind of drop this idea that it's meat and fish that's contributing to uric acid. No, it's fructose. Look at those societies that are eating a lot of fructose or a lot of sugar or drinking a lot of fruit juice. Then you'll see the uric acid. Then uric acid itself can have myriad consequences, including what Rick has outlined, namely stimulating hunger. What I have focused on, and back to the paper we're publishing, is looking at how uric acid is a contributor to insulin resistance. However, I consider it a secondary cause because it happens through its increase in inflammation. Uric acid is known to be an activator of inflammation. Now, what we're studying is to try to reconcile the, the paradox that some people notice on a ketogenic diet, which is twofold. On one hand, they may notice that in some people, the uric acid levels stay high or even go up a little. Second, their inflammatory markers have absolutely dropped. So there's much less inflammation and indeed much greater improvements in insulin sensitivity as evidenced by their resolution of type 2 diabetes. This shouldn't be happening given uric acid's involvement. However, what we are publishing, so this is early data here, um, so unpublished results at the moment, is that ketones are, in, are sufficient to wipe out the inflammation caused by uric acid. So ketones are known to be anti-inflammatory molecules. So this is another instance whereby ketones have gone beyond their simple caloric value. Ketones have a caloric value roughly comparable to glucose, which is good news for all the cells that want to use the ketones as energy. But at the same time, ketones act as a signaling molecule. And in this case, controlling, literally inhibiting inflammation. So whereas uric acid levels are trying to stimulate this kind of metabolic inflammation, ketones are inhibiting it. And that might help us reconcile how we could have a situation where a person has stubbornly elevated uric acid, and yet every metabolic and indeed inflammatory marker has improved. It's because there's a lot else going on, including the contribution of the ketones to directly antagonize the pro-inflammatory effects of the uric acid. So we, if you can see on your CGM or you notice that you start to crave stuff, then I would say that is something you need to start weaning yourself off of.